uh, this was called the impact of Hitler. And this is the British foreign policy. And this is probably the most controversial book, really, and the one which is widely known for outside the purely academic circles. The impact of Hitler, British diplomacy, foreign policy, 1933 to 1940. It was a very uh, provocative book in many ways. All of these books were published for the most part by Cambridge University Press, or the University of Chicago brought out a well-known edition of this particular book. The thesis of this book is that the British were reacting to the emergence of ferocious new Caesarisms, which is how we looked at Manchester on the European continent in the 1920s and 30s in various ways. Uh, what really mattered were the national factions within the leadership of the Conservative Party. Don't forget, everyone who knows anything about the history of this country in the 30s knows, Churchill and his group were complete outsiders during that period and were regarded as semi lunatics and wild men. It used to be said by ordinary Tories in the mid-30s, you're not one of those ghastly Churchill men, are you? You know, when they met people who they thought might be, the Churchill was an outsider who wanted to make trouble and wanted to do another enormous bloodbath for Germany, which much of that whole generation were determined to prevent occurring, given the fact that they were either caught in the first one between 1914 and 18, or lived through it, or relatives of theirs had died in it, and so on. Um, what I have at least is, is, which is deeply uh, unpleasant in relation to mainstream centre right opinion now, or they would have bothered about that. Uh, he was a man who never bothered whether people thought he was dead and so on. Uh, there was a degree to which he thinks the whole history of the Second World War and what follows it has been ludicrously sentimentalised and has even told you I think it's a good thing to do that I'm trying to do And also, that it's been written from a Labour point of view. In other words, the view of the Atlee administration, the view of people who were in opposition, I mean, quite sort of minor opposition up until the national government of 39-40, when essentially Chamberlain's uh, clique fell, when they came in, the radicals in the Labour Party, people like the young Michael Fuller, who wrote his book, straight chat book, straight pamphlet, called Those Guilty Men, the Appeasers. Uh, he thinks that Labour conquered the mental space in Britain long before they formed the, the absolute majority elected dictatorship, which is how you see democracy, uh, between 1945 and 1951. Labour, of course, through the Nationality Act of 1948, begins the process of mass immigration, initially from the old empire or the Commonwealth, which results in the society we have now. So Calvin believes, or believes, because of course he fell up with us, that Labour is crucial in its replacement of the Liberal Party as the centre of opposition within the British state and its regime. Um, the interesting thing is that a lot of his analysis of politics is Machiavellian in the sense that power and self-interest on behalf of wider groups are what politics is about. He doesn't believe in any of the, uh, of the um, nicer and more moral constructions that people do it for others, that they do it for the existing, that others will have for them, that they do it in order to serve the public good, as John Major once said. He would that as tawdry rubbish put forward by a political leader. So his view of everything is sort of slightly ferocious and acidic. Um, but his analysis of this country's decline, which is a sort of internalised and microscopic version of Karoli Barnett's thesis in the decline of British power, um, which views at the same events in a more narrative base, is the wider, less narrow, historical continuum. Both very similar, both upper middle class, growing wood things, but actually upper class men, both ultra conservatives of wide remit and culture, both outsiders in relation to the Britain, which has already been created by the middle of the last century, never mind before. Uh, don't be fooled by the fact there's many leftists for it, that there are lots of big W people who still run structures in this society. And the class of Welsh world in this country until about 1920 was gone. And we're not shot like in the Soviet Union or in the same like in revolutionary crimes to appear before. But they've gone. And it's now a mass bourgeois liberal society, which in his way of looking at things has been ethically and culturally proletarianized. And that's what you have if you take away the can from the soft words. And he basically uh, so that's the thesis of that book. Um, 
The other thing about the book, which shocked a lot of commentators at the time, is there's no moral judgment about Madison being seen as a ruthless leader, thrown up on the streets, in post-war, well, post-1918 Germany, um, six million German unemployed, men locked in your doorways, men without feet, men living in cardboard boxes. He offered them hope, he offered them vengeance, he offered them a group to hate and to blame it all. He regarded it as axiomatic. I would have was him on the cake he did it. Again, it's a German star. The German star meant to have democracy anyway. Um, these are views which almost have never even expressed now. Um, and also the idea that in a sense that movement represented Prussianism from the streets. But they returned the Second Reich in a very virile, forceful way because it, in some ways, lacked the polish of the old elite. And in many ways, as a Briton, he was able to figure Carroll in his analysis of that era and of that particular movement, which in many ways has become the most notorious movement of the 20th century, and he did it even today. Um, he was completely defeated and obliterated in 1945. It's strange how it's still alive, at least in the mental space that swirls around. Most people couldn't tell you who de Gaulle was, couldn't tell you who Roosevelt was. More people know who some supermodels dating than who was Prime Minister in 1940. But they all know about that particular dictator. It's quite strange how it's gone outside history and become a sort of part of the generalised psychopomp and mass culture. And it's always a sign with a historian if they don't play those sort of demonic games and if they adopt a hard-edged and unsentimental attitude, many liberals believe they adopt that attitude because life is attracted to it. In the case of someone like Alan Clark, that was, you knew Cali very well, that was not um, sort of a, a completely uncharitable view to the brain. Um, now, Cali wrote this book in which he basically said we should not have fought Germany, as he went to a bit of an Assembly Telegraph article, we should have done things that in 1941 after we were defeated in France, we should be left to one side, we would have kept the empire, we would have turned these mercilessly against Stalinist uh, communism and probably defeated it without another front. This was a revisionist, a soft revisionist thesis, but a very revisionist one, for which he was demonised and subject to quite a degree of obloquy. But uh, if you live at night in a tower at a Cambridge college, it probably, these brickbacks of outraged polytechnic fortune don't really shatter your windows, do they? So he only heard it as a muffled roar of the distance, really. That was certainly the most quote unquote demonic and near the edge word Calvin ever did. Um, it's interesting to note that it was sold by all sorts of groups all over the world, way beyond the portals of Chicago University Press or Cambridge University, the most extreme national socialist organization in the United States, which is called the National Alliance, and was led by Dr. William Pierce, actually sold Morris Calvin's um, the diplomatic response to Hitler. Um, because he understood intellectually where it was coming from, even in a dissentient way. So in a way, Calvin is prepared to be heretical. Calvin is prepared to do what soft leftists do. We basically say there are no enemies on the left. And when Claire Short once said when communism has been destroyed, communism has been defeated, communism has gone down. But Marxism has not been defeated. Back in many ways, the difference between the left and the right, the moderate leftists, who do not like the politics of communism, its harshness, their totalitarianism, its viciousness, its use of physical brutality, are its wrong, etc., etc. They don't like those over the right and stroke 1984 elements. But they are prepared to look at, to think about, and to use the theoretical ideas of an enormous range of Marxists from Gramsci to Adorno to Brekhanov and so on. They're not frightened with ideas. Whereas the conservative tradition largely, you know, students on open shop are all right, but if you go further out than that, it's regarded as terrifying and sort of you're you are stuffing with the devil, you know, and you have to have a very long spoon in order to do that. So in a sense he's reacting against that type of hypocrisy. The idea that some ideas are respectable and others are not. Where the star is even concerned, they're all ideas. Um, and many of them mask the urgency of power. Now, one critique of Calvin, which certain liberals were not slow to make, in terms of his work, not his manner of mode of life, um, was that there's a sort of nihilistic structuralism to this. That, that in a way, one of the absolutes that he believes in, I've said that he was a Tory on this. 
and Islam, um, which is a sort of an endorsement. And there's a complicated uh, element going on there. Um, 